Last week we looked at belonging to one another. We, we welcomed uh, new members to our life together and uh, heard a story from a new member and we belong to one another through our common faith in Jesus and uh, participation in his church. And today we're going to talk about our worship life. We worship in community. We worship God in community with authenticity, diversity, and passion. I just gave you all the fill-ins, uh, so we're done um, <laughs> right there. We worship God in community, and so we're renewing our commitment to the life that God has called us to, and in two weeks we're going to have the opportunity to, to uh, renew our commitment in our financial contributions by making a pledge to support the ministries of our church that all are aligned to these five banner words that really define our life together, the vision that God has given us to be the kind of church that God is calling us to be, the kind of Christ-centered church, the missional church that exists not just for the sake of ourselves, but for the world. And uh, the opportunity we have to pledge is something we can all do. This is a letter. We got a letter in the mail. We received this card in the mail. Um, it's in our pews. You can pick that up. And we're encouraging everyone this year to make a pledge because it, it's an opportunity for all of us to participate at whatever level God is calling us to do that. And uh, last week I mentioned that we were $250,000 in deficit in our budget, and someone asked me afterwards, is that because we're spending too much money? No, it's because we're not giving enough. That's really, I mean, it's a giving problem, not a spending problem. We're actually $40,000 below in our, in our spending. And, and that's not a criticism that we're not giving enough. It's we were so generous in our contributions to the Generations Campaign, especially with cash, we think that we just need to balance out our giving. And so we're praying about that how we can all participate, renew our commitment to what, what God is doing um, in the life of our church to change our lives, to transform our lives and to change the world. So I want to take a look at a passage today that will focus our attention on the kind of worship that God wants for us, Psalm 96. And as I read this passage, I want you to use the passage in the, in the outline, use a pen and circle a word or a phrase that speaks to you of worship. What, what is it, when, you, when I read through this passage, what is it that speaks to your heart about worship? Especially worshiping in community. Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. The first part of our banner statement is, we worship God in community. We worship God in community. All of these psalms that speak of worshiping the Lord, they're all in the plural. These aren't psalms to individuals. These are psalms to the people of God to worship the Lord. So all of you sing to the Lord, all of the earth, all you family of nations, everyone. Worship is a community event. They came together for the feasts in the temple, they made their sacrifices, they came from the ends of the earth, and they came to worship the one true God. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, praise his name, which means to acknowledge who he is, to lift up God's character as the one true God, proclaim his salvation day after day, to declare what God has done. Our, our stories of God on the move and the video stories that we see are an opportunity for us to proclaim his salvation. What God is doing to rescue men and women, boys and girls, whole families, individuals. What God is doing to rescue us from our sin. What God is doing to bring us wholeness and salvation. To bless us with every good and perfect gift to acknowledge what God has done as part of our common worship together. And the psalmist tells us to declare his glory, that our worship actually tells a story of God's glory, that our worship reminds us 
to each other of who God is, of his salvation. But our worship life together also proclaims to the world who God is. That what we do together tells a story to the world. What we do in our common life together here as we gather for worship is a message to those who are visiting and to those in our community of who God is and what God has done. So worship is about what we do together, but our worship has a ripple effect because of what we've done here. To declare his praise among the nations is to be a a kind of a worshiping community whose worship sort of leaks out into the world. Ken Blanchard yesterday was speaking to our San Diego Presbytery Leadership event. He's going to be preaching here on March 13th to kick off our series called Lead Like Jesus. And he's committed the rest of his life in his 70s. He's committed the rest of his life to equipping leaders all around the world to lead like Jesus. They are, uh, his book, Lead Like Jesus, is being translated into 40 different languages around the world. And um, people that we'll never meet or see are being trained to lead like Jesus. And he's going to be here. And um, I forgot why I told you that he was going to be here. <laughs> I don't know. Leaking out. Something's happening. Is this being taped here? Is this going to be online? Um, that what we do here actually matters, that actually communicates to the world around us who God is. Oh, I know. He wrote a story called The Most Loving Place in the World. And uh, his vision is that each of our churches would be the most loving places in our community. He said, imagine if people moved into your town and they didn't know anything about your church and, and they told someone they were looking for a church and they said, even somebody who didn't go to our church would say about us, well, you know what? Check out Solana Beach Presbyterian Church, which actually has happened before. Has anybody here ever been referred to our church by someone who doesn't come to our church? Anybody? Yeah, isn't that amazing? <laughs> Keep your hands raised up. How many, how many over here? Anybody? Isn't that amazing? I've heard people say that. I say, well, who told you about the church? Well, somebody in my neighborhood who, who doesn't go to church, who heard about our church, referred me to this church. I think that's kind of amazing. But he said, wouldn't it be awesome if people knew our church because this was the most loving place in town. And I think that has a lot to do with our worship life. How does our worship life leak into the community so that people may not know anything about what goes on here, but they know by reputation that God is worshipped here and that people love each other and love God. Community, we talked about last week, is belonging to one another is an interesting idea. It's kind of a miraculous thing that God brings diverse people together into a community, and that in itself is a sign of the kingdom. But there's a shift that takes place as we enter into this space and we worship in community. This space is not my space. That, I, I, I hate sitting there every week, but that is not my chair. That's not my pew. And those of you who sit in the same place every week and you know who you are, that's not your pew. And Mike, what's it like sitting in the front row here? Is it okay? Is it okay? It's kind of a front row. Some people say, you know, our church is too big. It's not intimate enough. All you have to do is sit in the front row. And and our sanctuary, really, our sanctuary just sort of shrinks down. It's like, wow. But this is not your space. It's not my space. This is God's space. And what happens here is is intended to worship the living God, not to meet our particular preferences for worship or the songs that we like to sing or, or whatever, the order of our worship. It's, this is God's space. This is holy space. Not because this is the only place where God dwells, but this is where God meets his people in worship. So we can't own this space as if it's our space and say, this is my worship service. This is, it's not mine. It's not Yours, this is God's space. And this is where the one another's of Scripture really speak to who we are in community. That we love one another. That we honor one another above ourselves. That we serve one another. That we forgive one another. That we're patient with one another. We bear with one another. Those are the marks of a, a community that's centered around the worship of God. Jean Vanier was the director of the large community where Henry Nouwen's life really was transformed as he engaged disabled adults in this community and 
and his best writing came after he visited the Larch community. He came much more deeply connected with who God is and who he is as he interacted with disabled adults who have no pretense. Jean Vanier wrote a book called uh, Growth in Community, and he says a community is only truly a body when the majority of its members is making the transition from the community for myself to myself for the community. When each person's heart is opening to all the others without any exception, this is the movement from egoism to love, from death to resurrection. It is the Easter, a passage, the Passover of the Lord. It is also the passing from a land of slavery to a pl promised land, the land of inner freedom. So our community, our worship in community is more than just me going to a particular service that I like or me coming to worship God, but it's, it's moving from me to us in the community that I'm here for you and you're here for me and we're here for each other to remind our, each other that God is the one true God to tell stories to one another, to remind each other that God is on the move, God is at work, to sing songs to each other, to God in each other's presence, to encourage each other and to build each other up and remind each other that we are not alone in this journey, but God meets us together in a unique way as we gather for worship. So there is a rhythm of the Christian life. We are called to worship God alone. There are times when we need to be alone with God, and I hope that all of us are finding space in our lives to use some of the normal activities of our lives to welcome God's presence and to be conscious that he's present there with us, to acknowledge who he is. I, I hope that all of us are finding those places alone during the week where we can worship God alone. But, but the worshiping of God together is essential. It's powerful. It's miraculous because it's God's community that he brings together to worship him, to sing a new song, to proclaim his deeds to sing of his salvation. We cannot do that alone. I can't do that alone. I need someone leading me into worship and I need to hear your voices. I need to hear you sing from the heart. I need to see you come. And so I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. There's this community experience of coming together in worship. So we worship God in community and we worship God with authenticity. We worship God in community with authenticity. The psalmist says, sing to the Lord a new song. You know, that's an interesting phrase. There's something authentic about a fresh, growing experience of worship. To sing a new song means that I'm constantly growing in my understanding of what God is doing in me and what God is doing in you and what God is doing in the world. Constantly refreshing my understanding of who God is. So it's kind of interesting when we call a particular service a contemporary service or a traditional service, right? Right? Because you could have a contemporary service that's very traditional because you sing the same songs that we sang 20 years ago, right? And we all have an expectation of what the next song is going to be. So just because you're in a contemporary service doesn't mean that it's not traditional. And so to, to, to worship with authenticity, to sing a new song means that we're always refreshing our ways of thinking of who God is and expressing our love and devotion to him. To sing a new song, the fresh, growing expression of what God is doing in our lives. To worship God with authenticity. The psalmist says, ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. So we bring the sacrifice of our lives. We, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices, Paul says in Romans 12. Here's what, how Eugene Peterson says that in the message. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. We place ourselves as an offering before the Lord in worship. We give ourselves, our whole selves. We love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And there's something about that offering of ourselves that is vulnerable and heartfelt, honest, we bring our real selves to God in worship. Now, as we look around at each other, just take a minute and just look down the pews and maybe behind you and in front of you. As we look at each other, go ahead and do that. Just kind of look side to side, back. As we do that, 
You know, nobody knows whether or not we bring our authentic selves. You know, you would never know by just looking at each other that there are people who have struggled in this last year during the recession. You'd never know that. You'd never know that in this sanctuary are people who are struggling in their marriages or in close relationships. You would never know that. You'd never know that there are people in the sanctuary who are struggling with addictions, who are struggle with sin and temptation. You would never know that. Why? Because we have a great way of keeping it together. Now, that's kind of appropriate. We don't come here and just, bleh, you know, sort of <laughs> regurgitate our heart to each other. And, and it's none of anybody's business in one sense. I hope you have somebody to share that with. And the question is not whether we fool each other. Remember Billy Crystal? You look marvelous, right? Darling, you look, mar you look marvelous. Really, darling, you do. It doesn't really matter how you feel. It's how you look. And you look marvelous, right? <laughs> and we actually believe that. So the question is not whether I fooled you, because I've got my suit on. I've got my Calvin Klein on. Yeah, that's Calvin Klein. It's nice. And I've got my Nordstrom tie on. It's not whether I fooled you, it's whether I fooled myself into thinking that I bring my real self before the Lord in worship, right? The question is not whether we pass the test with each other, and it's whether or not we are fooling ourselves to think that we don't really have a need and so if we don't have a need in worship, then we're just coming to be entertained or we're coming to be impressed, to give our approval of a good worship service. But if we bring our authentic selves, our honest selves, we recognize that we are all broken people in need of a saving God. And then we come into his presence together, not to be entertained, but to be healed and forgiven and restored, to be encouraged. We come as our authentic selves, honest about who we are and who we are not. We come humbly and honestly in reverence to God. So we started the service by me talking about body language that reminds us of how we worship the living God. And, and you know, the idea of bowing down, we did this the other night at the small group leader training. We bowed. I don't know the last time you bowed from the waist to bow like this? Have you ever been to an Asian country where people are continually bowing and you say, no, no, please, no, no, please, no, stop, please stop, no, please, please. <laughs> There's this show of respect and you know actually what this is is this is the most vulnerable position you could be in. Because if I go before the king and I bow, I'm trusting my life to the king. I, this is the most vulnerable position I could be in because he could lop my head off. Because that's his right. Right? We, we, we have ways of, of greeting each other that are much more, that are much more um, mutual. We shake hands with each other. But to come into someone's presence and to bow before them is to make myself vulnerable. And that's how we come before God. We, we give him honor and respect, and we realize that he gives life and he takes life away. And we're not worthy to be in his presence. And our necks are, are vulnerable and naked. We come as authentic selves before the living God. So our body language matters. So if, if we, we don't really express ourselves all that much in worship, and uh, it's helpful to just have the freedom to use my hands to do something different to remind myself that we're worshiping the King of kings and Lord of lords. Something that just says, wow, God, you're awesome. And I just want to remember that it's not about me, it's about you. So I relinquish control. I, I let go of who I am. I submit to the Lord. So we give ourselves as an offering. So as we take the offering on Sunday morning, the giving of our financial resources is an extension of us just giving ourselves to the Lord. All that we are, we give to him. And so our financial giving becomes a, a habit because it represents our real selves, not just, not just um, sort of our spiritual selves, but our real selves. We, we give that over to the Lord, and so a percentage of our income goes to the work of the Lord because it's a, a, 
a tangible, concrete representation of our life and what matters to us. We place that before the Lord as a sacrifice. So we worship God in community with authenticity and diversity. That's the third. And diversity. So look at the varieties of people who were there. Ascribe to the Lord all you families of nations. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. So family of nations is all those who gather together in Jerusalem for the feast. They're all coming together from every corner of the earth. They're, they're dispersed. Both those Gentile believers and Jewish believers, they come together. Uh, and as they, they enter into the temple together, what you see is different dress and language and customs all coming together to worship the Lord. Now, as we gather together for worship, we don't really look very multicultural in, in, the, in the strict sense of cultures. But we actually uh, represent different backgrounds and age and experience and understanding of the church and spiritual growth. And we're also trying to grow in the culture of our children and our students engaged with us in worship. And that, believe it or not, even though we speak the same language and our kids look mostly like us, that is crossing cultural boundaries. And it requires us to think of how we express ourselves in diversity in our worship. And how, how our different expressions of worship can stretch our understanding who God is. So actually, by embracing the different cultures that might come together and worship together, we actually expand our understanding of who God is and how he's worshipped. I, I love the, the, the story recently of our high school and junior high students who came together for worship on a Wednesday night to have an experiential worship night. Now, if you had walked into that place, I don't know how you would have responded or whether you would have thought that was legitimate worship, but they spread out into different stations where they could journal. Brendan was playing his guitar, and, and, and you could listen or you could sing or not. And the result of that was junior high and high school students bowing together, praying together, confessing their sins to each other, asking forgiveness from one another. That's, that's pretty awesome. I would say that is true worship. And we want to learn from our students and children and we want them to learn from us. And so in the months ahead, as we're looking at our worship services, and uh, establishing a new worship service in our 1030 service, a contemporary worship, taking some of the gifts from our, our 645 service, moving them to 1030, uh, and, and, and inviting students to participate in all of our services. I pray that we would be stretched in our understanding of what it means to worship God, and that we would embrace that, and to see God in new ways as our children are worshiping next to us, I love that. They need to see us worship, and we need to see them worship. So we worship in diverse ways, different songs. Sometimes we sing hymns. Sometimes we sing the most recent songs. Sometimes we sing some other songs. Sometimes we pray in different ways. We ask you to hold your hands or to stand or do something different so that we can experience the fullness of who God is. So what centers our diversity, what centers our diversity in worship is that we focus on the Word of God. That the Word of God is read and preached, and when that happens, that Jesus shows up in a unique, powerful, life-changing way. The preaching of God's Word, gathering around the sacraments that remind us of God's grace, ties us together as a community of faith, whether we worship here at this service or the one that follows. The preaching of God's word centers us in reminding us that we worship the living God. We worship in community. We worship God in community with authenticity, diversity, and passion. Now, these words that are chosen are, are um, we, we settled on these words, and maybe we'll come up with new words in the days ahead to describe our worship, but these were values that were developed by those who were leading worship. We got together uh, five or six years ago, and we, we brainstormed, what is it that we really want to see happen? And we talked about passion, and when you use a word like passion, it means different things to different people. And if we think of how we express passion, we all have different personalities and um, um, 
sense of freedom and how we express ourselves. Some, uh, the psalmist talks about singing, proclaiming, declaring. There's a kind of passion that is described by words. You might use a word like enthusiastic or uh, conviction or devotion. Others might w- use words like affection or intensity. But each of us has different ways of expressing our love for God. If worship is expressing our love for the God of the universe, the one true God, then how is it that each of us, in our own way, expresses passion, giving ourselves? We sing a new song, meaning that that love for God is always being renewed. The song that Brendan sang before the message comes out of John chapter 12. It's this beautiful story of Mary taking a a pound of, of... of perfume and pouring it on Jesus' feet. And the disciples, as they often did, criticized that behavior. Judas, in particular, thought it was a waste, that that pure perfume could have been used, could have been sold, and, and it could have been used to feed the poor. And Jesus receives this beautiful, extravagant expression of personal devotion to him from Mary allows her to pour the perfume on his feet to anoint him and then to take her own hair in her tears and to wipe away the perfume. And it's a beautiful image of coming into the presence of God, whether alone or together with others, and giving him our very best and worshiping him in some extravagant way that that where we lose ourselves. And the impact of that was not just that Jesus was blessed or that she experienced worship with Jesus, but that the perfume filled the whole house. There was a fragrance from her worship that, that, that filled the whole house. And everyone knew that Jesus was being worshipped. There's something about us Worshiping God with passion that creates a beautiful aroma so that others around us know that that Jesus is being worshipped, that that aroma leaks out the doors, and the community knows that Jesus is being worshipped here because we have loved him extravagantly. We have given ourselves to him wholeheartedly, We've entered into worship, not for my sake, but for his sake. I check my ego at the door and I enter in humbly as a broken person in need of his healing and his forgiveness and his restoration. We worship God in community with authenticity, diversity, and passion. Let's pray and then we'll sing together. I invite you to open your hands on your lap. As we open our hearts and our lives to the living God. God, we acknowledge today your salvation. And the ways that you have reached down into our lives and saved us. You've forgiven us. You've wiped the slate clean. We know that we're forgiven and we are saved by you by Jesus' blood shed, that by his death on the cross and his resurrection, we experience forgiveness and new life. And so we humbly give you thanks for that. We offer ourselves here at the end of this service to remind us that as we worship you, we don't stop worshiping you as we leave the sanctuary, but we continue to offer our everyday walk-around lives We offer ourselves to you as living sacrifices so that as we work and live and play in those places where you send us, that the aroma of our worship uh, is experienced by those around us. That our community, the world, the nations would know that you live, that you change lives, that you save because we have worshiped here together. pray for our common life together as a worshiping community, that as we worship you, no matter how we worship you, 
no matter who is worshiping with us, that you would be lifted up as King of kings and Lord of lords. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.